Hello everyone and welcome back to Economic Survey Series 2022-23. Today we are going to do one of the very crucial topics of Economic Survey which is Agriculture. The name of the topic is Agriculture and Food Management from food security to nutritional security. But before we look into the content of the economic survey this year for the topic agriculture, I have a story for you. Initially, when we look at the population, it was limited. So suppose these are the farmers. These farmers used to own big pieces of land. So this is our agricultural land. So the land size used to be big initially. So for example, if you look at 2005 and 6, on an average, Every farmer used to hold 1.23 hectares of land. That was the average farm size. But as we saw that the population kept on increasing in India, the population of the farmers also increased in the rural areas and there was land fragmentation. So initially look at the size of the land and then look at the size of the land. So there has been fragmentation in the land size. Because of that, if you look at the figures for 2015 and 16, the average farm size has reduced to 1.08 hectare. Right. So initially the farm size was 1.23 hectares, 2005 and 6, but 2015-16 the average farm size reduced, which means the size of the plot, average plot reduced. Look at the size of the rectangle please. What are the problems because of this? The problem that happened is disguised unemployment, which means population is more and every family has small piece of land now. So on a small piece of land, 20 people are working, whereas only one person is required. So this is called as disguised unemployment. What is the result of disguised unemployment? The income of the rural community or farming community does not increase that much. So there is a stagnancy in income. Productivity of the land also becomes a stagnant. Why? Because on a small piece of land, how much technology can you use? You cannot use big level technology, etc. Because of that, the productivity of the land is also limited. Now, low income, low technology and low productivity. Because of that, what do the farmers do in India basically? When they produce crop, suppose they work very hard and there is bumper produce. What happens to their quality? Their quality is very normal and they are forced to sell those crops in the local mandis because they are small farmers, individual farmers, their bargaining capacity is also very weak. So they are forced to sell the crops in the local mandis called as APMC mandis where they are exploited by the arhatiyas or the middlemen. That's option number one. Option number two, the government of India every year is mandated to provide minimum support prices to at least 22 crops. So these farmers can also sell their crop under MSP, Minimum Support Price Program to Government of India. But you know that Government of India does not go everywhere to buy the crop. So the coverage of Minimum Support Price Program is very limited in India. Hardly 10 to 13 percent of the farmers get the benefit of that. The third option in front of the farmer is that the farmers sell their crop at whatever price they are getting. So they do not go to the APMC mandis, they do not give the crop to the government of India under MSP program, but in their local mandis, whatever price, 2 rupees a kg, 3 rupees a kg, they are forced to sell that. It is called as distress sale. So because of land fragmentation over a period of time and increasing population, these are the problems that the farming community has suffered. Now, what can the government of India do or what has the government of India done to improve the situation? So see, these are our farmers. Now the government of India created a program called as doubling farmers income. This was a committee which was established in 2016. The committee gave the report in 2018 and it talks about different methods of doubling the farmers income in India. Now, so that is called as income support. So based on doubling farmers income report, the government of India has implemented a lot of schemes in India. For example, PM Kisan or the changes that have been made in Kisan credit card. All these things have been done after this report came. Now, we also need to make sure that since the farm size of the farmers are small, we provide them alternate sources of income. For example, you see along with farming, our farmers to support them, to support their livelihood, they also indulge in animal husbandry. For example, fish rearing or, or meat, fish, eggs, etc. So we need to provide them alternate source of income through animal husbandry and we also need to create food processing industry in India because food processing industry will not only provide employment, support to the farmers, it will also help us to reduce food wastage in India. So food processing industry must be promoted.
Now, along with that, we need to provide more infrastructure facilities to the farmers so as to protect their crops and also mechanization. For example, if basic tractors are required, basic tools and implements are required, we should provide it. Similarly, in case of, for example, flood, excess rainfall or for example heat waves the crop of the farmer many a times is destroyed like because of landslide in hilly areas crops are destroyed we need to give insurance to the farmer one new program which the government is is putting a lot of focus upon in india is called as organic farming under organic farming the farmers resort to chemical free farming we are facing a problem of climate change across the world so agriculture is also facing that stress so to help the farmers produce the suitable kind of crop, given the fact that climate change is a reality, the government of India has started climate smart agriculture practice also. So this entire topic that we are going to study in, in the field of agriculture, it will revolve around these realities related to agriculture sector. Now, as usual, before we start the topic on agriculture, I'm going to tell you in how many different parts we are going to divide this topic to develop a good understanding of chapter number eight economic survey. See, the topic called agriculture and food management can be divided into four different parts uh, from the economic survey. The first part would talk about agriculture. In agriculture, first we are going to look at how the performance of agriculture sector has been. So this we are going to do through performance indicators. Then we are going to study some schemes related to agriculture. For example, doubling farmers income. Now what has been the flow of cash or money in the field of agriculture? Who is investing in agriculture? Then we are going to do some schemes related to mechanization of agriculture, then organic farming and other schemes as well. Then we will do allied sector because I told you that allied sector provides a lot of support to agriculture sector. So allied sector means animal husbandry, dairy, fisheries, etc. And what is their contribution in the field of agriculture? Then we will also focus upon cooperative movements in India and, and what changes the government has made in the field of cooperatives. Cooperative means a group of farmers cooperating with each other. Then we are going to do the analysis of food processing industry in India and under that we will do three important things. So Pradhan Mantri Kisan Sampada Yojana, formalization of micro food processing enterprises and production linked incentive scheme. These are the three things we'll do here. Then we will get into a very crucial topic called as food security because the ultimate objective of agriculture is to provide food security to the people. So we are going to do the meaning of food security, then National Food Security Act 2013 and then one scheme called as One Nation One Ration Card scheme. Let's begin with agriculture sector, the performance indicators. What are the performance indicators that we are going to examine today? So we are going to look at growth rate, production, export, credit and investment. This particular figure shows the growth of agriculture in the last few years. Now see, there is something called as the rate of growth and then there is something called as trend. Trend means whatever is the long term pattern in the growth and growth rate means this year's growth, last year's growth. So let's have a look. So see. <clears throat> If we start to look from 2014-15, the rate of growth of agriculture sector was negative here. Then it became positive 6.8, 6.6. There is a lot of zigzag, see, a lot of up and down is there. Now, if you look at the COVID time, the rate of growth of agriculture was 3.3%. If you look at the average rate of growth of agriculture from 2016 to 2021, 22, if you look at this one, two, three, four, five, six years, we will see that the average rate of growth of agriculture is 4.6%, which means if you look at this timeline, average rate of growth 4.6% per year. But if you look at this year's rate of growth is just 3%, which means this year's rate of growth is less than last five, six years of average. That's number one. Number two, if we have to find what is the trend in the rate of growth of agriculture. So for example, somebody asked us that what is the trend between 2014, 15 and 15, 16. So see, the agriculture sector is going up. It reached its peak here. And then if we have to examine what is the trend from 2016 to 2020, how, how do we find the trend? So whenever somebody says find the trend between 2016 and 2020, so we have to mark a point into 2016 for example like this and then we have to mark a point here and then we have to connect these two points so for example when we connect this point this is the trend line this line is called as trend line 
it clearly shows that initially agriculture sector was growing and then agriculture se sector is continuously you know coming down in terms of rate of growth so the trend in agriculture is not that positive now <clears throat> But there are one or two good things which has happened. So, for example, if you look at the export from agriculture sector in 2021, it is greater than 2020 by 18%. So, there is 18% jump in our export in the year 2021 compared to 2020. One of the things which I, I found uh, to be missing in the economic survey was they should have mentioned what is the agricultural rate of growth in 2022 also. They stopped at 2021 here. Now... <clears throat> Now let's look at some seasons in India. So there are basically three agricultural seasons. Kharif from June to November. It is called monsoon season. Now Rabi. Rabi is from November to January winter season. And then there is Zaid in between Kharif and Rabi. So it is March to June. So basically the crop that you grow in Kharif mainly rice. But rice is grown in India both in Kharif and Rabi. But majorly in Kharif. Now what is the Rabi crop? Mostly wheat. And then Zayed is mostly the watery crops like cucumber, pumpkin, tomatoes, etc. Now, if you look at the trend, we can clearly see that in the Kharif season this time, there was delayed monsoon, which means rice should have been impacted. But, and, and, and mind you, rice was actually impacted because of delayed monsoon, the area under cultivation of rice was less, but the production was good. So in 2022, the Kharif rice production is greater than the last six years average, maybe because of productivity. Now, in Rabi, which is the winter crop, we saw heat waves in India. Heat waves not very good for wheat production. But despite that, the wheat production has been good, decent. It came down in some of the states, but generally overall, according to economic survey, it's good. Again, one of the things missing is like the detailed data of 2022 is not given in the economic survey related to each of these. A broad trend is given, but details not given. Now, <clears throat> let's look at the overall production. See, in 2014-15, this is the overall production of food grains in million tons. This is 252 million tons. This is 315. So if we have to find the trend line, connect these two dots and you will see the trend is increasing. So economic survey says that this year, 2022, Again, see, they stopped at 21. In 2022, economic survey says, if you look at the Kharif crops, the Kharif crop, produ crop production of 2022 is greater than the past few years average, last five, six years of average. They are only talking about Kharif crop. Now, <clears throat> let's look at the flow of credit or money in the field of agriculture. See, so guys, if we look here, this is in lakh crores. So see 2014-15, lakh crores. And then in 2021-22, 18.6 lakh crores. So if you see, if you join these points, we will see that there is consistent increase in the flow of credit in the field of agriculture. So money is increasing in the field of agriculture. And there is something more mentioned that every year, the government of India fixes a target for agricultural credit that this much money has to be given in the field of agriculture. So we observe that every year, whatever target the government sets, the actual flow of credit is more than our target, which is a very positive sign. So in 2021, for example, the actual flow of credit here was 13% more than the target. So this is also a good thing. Now, let's talk about the field of agriculture when it comes to investment. So who invests in the field of agriculture? When you say investment, where do we invest in the field of agriculture? For example, irrigation facilities, soil improvement techniques, etc. And basic infrastructure related to agriculture. So if you look at 2011 and 12, you see the investment made by the government was 5.4%. The investment made by private sector was 9.3%. If we look at 2019, 20 and 20, 2021, so there is stagnancy in the government investment in the field of agriculture, which means that the government has not been able to increase its investment. And yes, that's not a good sign. But if we look at the private investment in the field of agriculture, this has increased. It is 9.3%. So there is a lot of gap between government and private investment. So private investment is doing well. Government investment has become stagnant. That is what the economic survey is saying. 
Now, if we look at the government schemes related to agriculture, that is called as government intervention. So, you know what Government of India did? Government of India created a committee in 2016 called as Doubling Farmers Income Committee. And they suggested to the Government of India the seven point program that if we follow these seven points, the average income of the farmers would improve, especially the small and marginal farmers. So, what are they saying? They are saying if you want to improve the income of the farmer, then there must be increase in productivity. What is the meaning of productivity from same piece of land? So for example, from same piece of land, there should be more production. Right. So same piece of land gives more production is called productivity. Second is increase in livestock productivity, animal rearing, fishy culture, etc. Now resource use efficiency or saving in the cost of production. We must find techniques which will reduce the cost of production for the farmers, for example, through improved use of machines, tractors, etc. Increase in cropping intensity. Mean, cropping intensity means that we should plant more crops on the same field. So that is called as cropping intensity. Now diversification towards high value crop. So if we promote the farmers to produce high value crop, cash crops, which will give them higher price that will raise their income. For example, cotton, sugar, sugar cane, etc. Improvement in real price received by the farmer. See, if our farmers work very hard, for example, if you go to the tomato belt of India, Gujarat, Karnataka, Andhra, Odisha, Maharashtra, or go to the potato belt of India, Gujarat, UP, Bihar, West Bengal, these are the potato belt. Whenever there is good production of tomatoes, onion, potatoes, rice, wheat, the price that our farmers get is very low. That is called distress sale. Government of India has to find ways to improve the price received by the farmers. And we also have to shift from farm to non-farm occupations. I told you in the field of agriculture, disguised unemployment has happened. So whatever is the number of people required in the field of agriculture, more people are there compared to requirement. We have to shift those people to other activities like food processing industry or basic manufacturing. That is the next point. So when the doubling farmers income report was submitted in 2018 the government of india started to redesign all the schemes of india and introduce new schemes to implement each of these points we are going to study those points now now the first point that i want to explain to you is called minimum support prices why because they said that farmers must receive good price how to ensure good price so now guys imagine that i am a farmer now, this is my agricultural field where I am growing crops. This is the tractor I have used. This is the seeds I have used. This is me and this is my family, children, etc. Basically, we are talking about agricultural household, which means this is the farmer, wife, children, etc. Now, this is the money that the farmer has used. This is farmer's own cash, own savings. And this land is farmer's own land, which means this land. Now. Suppose the farmer cultivates this crop and the farmer is cultivating, let's say rice. Total cost of cultivation. How do you calculate total cost of cultivation of rice? So for example, one way to calculate what is the cost of cultivation of rice is to look at the price of tractor, seeds, fertilizer, etc. So whenever we look at the price of inputs, like tractor, seed or whatever input the farmer has bought from the market. When we add all those prices, that is called as cost of production. That cost of production has a name, it is called A2. So government of India sometimes, when they feel that the farmers are not able to sell their product in the market, suppose their A2 cost of production is 30 rupees. For rice, 1 kg rice, 30 rupees. And the farmers in the market are getting 10 rupees for rice. 10 rupees will not recover the cost. So government of India can come and offer 30 rupees to the farmer as minimum support prices. And who recommends minimum support price to the government of India? CACP. CACP makes the recommendation and who takes the final decision regarding minimum support price? CECA. This is one method. Second method of calculating minimum support price is that look at all the inputs that the farmer is using. For example, tractor, seed, etc. which the farmer has bought from the market and also add the you know wages that the farmer would have paid to his family so for example suppose farmer's wife and children are also working in the agricultural field and farmer has to pay wages to them salary to them since he's using his own family he's not paying salary but if these people would have worked elsewhere they would have got the salary 
So now what we are doing is since farmer is using his own family, we have to calculate what wages his family would have received. Right. So we will calculate the cost of tractor, seeds and wages that the farmer would have paid, paid to the family called imputed wages. So that is called as input plus family labor A2 plus FL. So the government of India, if it calculates the cost of input plus family labor, it comes out to be 70 rupees. So actually the farmer should be paid 70 rupees as the minimum support price. Third method called as C2. What is C2? So what we do is look at what the farmer is doing here. Farmer is buying seeds and tractor from the market. Farmer is using his family labor. So input plus FL. Now the farmer is also using his own cash. If farmer would have given this cash to a bank, he would have received some interest rate from the bank through fixed deposit, etc. If farmer would have invested this money in the market, he would have got interest rate. Similarly, farmer is using his own land. If farmer would have given this land as rent to somebody, he would have received rent. So if you look at the overall cost of cultivation, we have to add the tractor, seed, the wages paid to the family. We also have to calculate how much interest rate the farmer would have received if he would have given this money for investment purposes. Interest rate is also added and we also have to add what is the rent farmer would have received for his land had he given this land to somebody on rent. So when you add all these things input plus family labor plus interest plus rent it is called C2 cost. So there are three methods of giving minimum support price to the farmer. Either we give minimum support price based on A2 or A2 plus FL or A2 plus FL plus interest plus rent. These are the three ways. Now Swaminathan committee has told the government of India that we should use C2 to provide minimum support price to the farmer because if farmer is using his own cash and land, we should compensate the farmer. But the government of India is currently using A2 plus FL to provide MSP to the farmer. So what is the formula of government of India? So suppose guys, the cost of the cost of inputs, tractor, seed and the cost of family labor. If you add everything, it is 100 rupees for cultivation. So the government of India gives 100 rupees plus 50% of 100. What is 50% of 100? 50. So 100 plus 50. 150 rupees is given by government of India as MSP these days. Which means whatever is the cost of production, government multiplies it with 1.5 and gives it as MSP to the farmers. And which cost do we use? Which formula do we use to calculate cost of production? A2 plus FL currently. So 1.5 into and A2 plus FL is 100. So 1.5 into 100 is 150 rupees. This is the formula we use and in, in India, this is what I have mentioned in India, the government of India has announced according to economic survey MSP for 22 crops and it has increased. Now guys, another uh, method through which the government of India provides income support to the farmer is called as Kisan credit card scheme. So see what is Kisan credit card. Now imagine that you are a farmer. Most of the farmers in India are small and marginal. Right, almost 86% farmers in India are small. If you are a small farmer to buy seeds, fertilizers, etc., you don't have cash. How will you carry on cultivation? So the government of India started a scheme in 1998 called as Kisan Credit Card. Why? Because government of India realized that our small farmers have go to have to go to informal sources of finance like zamindar, etc., to take cash and then do the cultivation. If the farmers were unable to return the money of the zamindars, farmers land was snatched away. So the government of India started a program called as Kisan credit card in 1998 to provide cash to the farmers at concessional rates so that the farmer can buy inputs like seed fertilizer etc. In 2004, allied activities and non-farming activities were also included. So if you are doing things like you know allied activities related to agriculture that was also covered livestock etc. In 2012, the government of India simplified Kisan credit card scheme and electronic Kisan credit card scheme was launched. In 2018-19, the Kisan credit card facility was extended to fisheries and animal husbandry farmers also. And in 2020 COVID times, there was some revision or changes in the policy of Kisan credit card. The government of India said that now they are going to provide concessional loans to the farmers or cash to the farmers for cultivation purposes to buy seeds fertilizer 
for post harvest operations for example storage etc transportation and consumption for farmer household and suppose i am a farmer i my crop is ready but i have not been able to sell my crop how will i support my family how will i give food medical expenses health care etc of my family so for that purpose also kisan credit card can be used by the farmers to withdraw money now atmanirbhar bharat package which was announced during covid said that the government of india is going to provide 2 lakh crore rupees concessional credit to 2.5 crore farmers to 2.5 crore farmers the government of india decided to disburse rupees 2 lakh crore rupees to help them during covid and the government said that there will be special focus on animal husbandry and fisheries in the kisan credit card scheme so this is regarding credit there is one more scheme guys which is interest rate subvention scheme see so suppose you are a farmer and you require up to 3 lakh rupees for short term purposes because you have to buy the inputs of production etc you have to pay the electricity bill and all those things that you have to provide you have to take care of your needs related to farming so under the scheme the government provides up to 3 lakh rupees for short term credit requirement of farmers suppose the rate of interest is 7% at 7% but suppose the farmer takes this loan and starts to make timely repayments right if you are returning the money of the government of india in a time bound manner then the government of india gives you reward also 3% concession or subsidy is given in the interest rate so you can take up to 3 lakh rupees normally at 7% rate but when 3% concession is given the net rate of interest for the farmer becomes 4% so who who all can take this loan those who are farmers in the field of cultivation of crops or allied activities like animal husbandry dairy poultry fisheries you can take up to 3 lakh rupees at effective rate of interest of 4% now we are going through the next mission which is called as sub mission on agricultural mechanization now see there are tractors right why do we need them remember i told you the story that our agricultural fields are small it's it's difficult to increase the production without using technology so we need basic technology in the field of agriculture but farmers don't have cash right because farmers 86% farmers in india are small and marginal they don't have cash to buy the tractors so the government of india has created a model whereby if the farmer has cash they can buy the tractor if they don't have cash the government of india is creating these centers like this where tractor will be available for rent so farmer can take it on rent but suppose you don't have money to pay rent also government of india has created a scheme whereby farmers can go to these centers and take the tractor on rent so that scheme is called sub mission on agricultural mechanization let me explain this so guys <clears throat> suppose this is our total agricultural land in india this rectangle is total agricultural land divide this total agricultural land of india into 50 50 50% land 50% land now if we focus we can find that 86% of our small and marginal farmers they own almost 50% land or less than 50% land rest 14% large or rich farmers own 50% land so on one hand 86% farmers have 50% land on the other hand 14% farmers have 50% land these rich farmers have big land they can use technology etc but these small farmers they have fragmented land the government of india says since you have fragmented land you cannot take benefit of large scale production so guys large scale production is called economies of scale when you produce on large scale your cost of production is low but these farmers cannot take advantage of that second problem is their productivity is low why because they have a small piece of land they are not able to produce more third their cost is also very high cost of production is high because they are small farmers they cannot afford good seed good fertilizer and tractors so they cannot take advantage of large scale production their productivity is low and their cost is very high so government of india wants them to reduce their cost increase their productivity and take advantage of large scale production how is it possible so the government of india has created custom hiring center government of india promotes the creation of custom hiring centers whereby agricultural tools and machines are available like this a farmer can come and for example to hire this tractor 100 rupees is required government of india is ready to give 30 
to 50 percent out of suppose 100 rupees is required to hire this tractor government of india is ready to give 30 to 50 percent of 100 rupees as subsidy to the farmers and maximum subsidy under this is 1.25 lakh rupees per farmer so farmer can come take the subsidy from the government 30 30 to 50 percent and hire the tractor bring the tractor in the field and increase the production productivity reduce the cost and increase farmers income now guys we have also started chemical free india organic and natural farming so the government of india is promoting natural farming in india and chemical free agriculture how see guys so if you look at the current status of india almost 60 lakh hectares of land is covered under organic farming in india 60 lakh hectares which is a good amount now how many farmers are engaged in organic farming in india 45 lakh farmers are engaged in organic farming which is world's largest now sikkim became the first state of india to become fully organic tripura and uttarakhand they are also on the same track now organic farming is very important why not only because it helps the farmer to get good prices for the product but under organic farming less chem no chemicals are used actually now if chemicals are not used in farming it doesn't enter our body human system so health wise also it's good so let us see what is happening in india in the field of organic farming how many schemes are there in the field of organic farming in india paramparagat krishi vikas yojana Bharatiya Prakritik Krishi Paddhati BPKP then natural farming or zero budget natural farming and then mission organic value chain development of northeast region these are the four schemes that we are going to study in the field of organic farming but to understand these schemes we need to go back to 2008 and see what was one of the biggest schemes in India related to environment and sustainable development because this organic farming etc came from there only see in the year 2008 the government of india started a scheme called national action plan on climate change this is the scheme we started action national action plan on climate change 2008 now the target under napcc it has been extended up to 2025 what are the things that were done under this plan <clears throat> so national action plan on climate change under it the government of india created eight missions and all these missions are taking care of sustainable development and climate change in different fields of life for example which are the eight missions under it the first mission is called national solar mission it is related to promoting solar energy second is mission for enhanced energy efficiency so the government of india started to create more rules and regulations to promote efficient use of energy that is the second mission third mission is sustainable habitat which means when we plan our cities urban areas or buildings it has to use more renewable energy then mission for strategic knowledge of climate change how do you understand climate change through science and technology research and development that is promoted here national mission for sustainable himalayan ecosystem you know himalayan ecosystem has a lot of biodiversity isn't it there are a lot of glaciers there so government of india created this mission to protect the himalayas national water mission government of india says everybody should get water and we should protect our groundwater river water etc so that is this mission national mission on sustainable agriculture now before that let me explain green india mission under green india mission we are trying to reduce the carbon emission we are trying to minimize the carbon emission what is national mission for sustainable agriculture see guys under national mission for sustainable agriculture the government of india started programs to protect soil nutrients through soil health card so for example if a soil has enough of nitrogen but soil does not have phosphorus then the government of india says we should add phosphorus based fertilizer only and we should not unnecessarily add nitrogen based on whatever is missing in terms of nutrients from the soil we should add only that so soil management is important water water for irrigation is also important related to agriculture and third important element of sustainable agriculture is organic farming government of india said we should try to use less chemicals as less as possible so what are the different schemes that we have started related to organic farming in india first one two three four these are the four schemes now paramparagat krishi vikas yojana what is this scheme under this scheme the government of india says that 50 or more than 50 farmers have to come together and they have to arrange minimum 20 hectares of agricultural land 
when they do that the government of india will provide them 50000 rupees per hectare 50000 per hectare for 3 years so that they can promote organic farming in this field and to promote organic farming they have to use uh, you know things which are eco friendly for example they will not use any chemical etc so for using eco friendly things government of india provides them 50000 rupees per hectare that is paramparagat krishi vikas yojana now large area certification program look at the map of india so imagine that this is the map of india now this is desert these are islands these are hills so if you look at hills island tribal areas and desert areas these are the areas of india which have a very good culture historically that they promote mostly organic farming only so those areas which already have organic farming and they don't use chemicals the government of india has started to give them certificate called as large area certification program and the government of india gives them financial support also to promote organic farming now natural farming so government of india guys has started to promote the concept of natural farming whereby no fertilizer pesticide or chemical is used it is not used when you do not use fertilizer pesticides or chemicals your cost of cultivation also comes down this is called natural farming and what is the product chemical free farming so when do you don't use these kind of chemicals and artificial things cost of cultivation comes down and you get chemical free farming and this is called natural farming natural farming is also called as zero budget natural farming why because when you don't use chemical etc cost of cultivation comes down so if somebody will ask you guys in upsc mains or prelims that what are the components of natural farming what will you say these are the 12 components of natural farming so for example no external inputs you don't have to use any chemical fertilizer pesticide etc soil to be covered with crop 365 days proper use of soil now <clears throat> minimal disturbance of the soil let the soil remain in a natural state don't create disturbances bio stimulants as necessary catalyst so if you want to increase production don't use chemicals use bio stimulants for example some bacteria are known to improve the soil fertility use that use indigenous seed right don't use you know seeds which have been brought from other parts of the world it might not be suitable for india mixed cropping so for example we can grow wheat along with pulses because wheat consume a lot of nitrogen from the soil pulses provide nitrogen to the soil so create combination in such a way that two crops should be selected so that they both support each other integration of trees into the farm it is called agroforestry it prevents soil erosion etc water and moisture conservation should be there animal rearing should also be done along with farming organic residues on the soil which means that if leaves of the plant are falling on the soil we should not remove it pest management through botanical extract we should use for example neem neem based natural spray for pest control no synthetic fertilizer pesticide or herbicide should be used natural fertilizers natural organic manure should be used these are the 12 components of natural farming now under the concept of natural farming only guys this is the concept where we don't use pesticides etc so it reduces the cost of production hence it is called zero budget natural farming to promote natural farming in india only one of the schemes launched is called as bhartiya prakritik krishi paddhati bhartiya means indian prakritik means natural krishi means agricultural and paddhati means mechanism or process so under it we are going to use in india we are going to use and promote the indigenous methods of cultivation how i'll tell you so for example guys suppose that the leaf of the plant the branches etc have fallen on the soil we we decompose it through natural process and convert it into organic manure for example if we are doing animal rearing along with cultivation the dung of the cows and, uh, and 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 buffalo for example the animal <clears throat> that cow dung can be used for organic farming as well similarly if we have to cultivate a particular plant we must do basic soil management practices so that more oxygen can enter the soil also through tilling of the soil so what are the basic things that we do under bhartiya prakritik krishi paddhati which means we promote traditional indigenous practices biomass recycling we take the leaves of the dead plant etc and we recycle it cow dung is used 
plant specific soil preparation is also done and for all, doing all these things the government of india provides a cash of 12200 rupees per hectare for 3 years so for 3 years the government of india gives 12200 rupees per hectare to promote all these three activities eight states of india for example andhra jharkhand odisha kerala eight states of india have actually got 4 lakh hectares of land under natural farming where they are following this uh, principle of indigenous traditional agriculture now the next scheme is called mission organic value chain development for northeastern region 2015 i'll tell you what is happening under this so under this scheme guys the government of india is motivating the farmers and promoting them that farmers should come in groups like this group of farmer is called farmer producer organization so government of india is saying that farmers should come in group like this and when they come collectively the government of india says that they can use common storage facility common processing facility if basic items are to be processed common processing facility common packaging facility and common marketing facility these are the things that they can use in common now when farmers come in group when they use all these common facilities it saves cost and second when their product is ready they can collectively go to some industry food processing industry and sell it so collective growing the crop managing the crop and collectively selling the crop these things can happen under the scheme called as mission organic value chain development uh, you know for northeastern region now you know northeastern and, and where do we follow all these things in what kind of crops for example if you go to assam you can see that uh, you know or northeast of india in general you can see there are very you know exotic crops which are very costly and if farmers create a group to manage that crop and sell that crop their income will increase for example johar rice so so that for that you can use this scheme now guys let us have a look at some other schemes related to agriculture now see one of the scheme that the government of india has started to give income support to the farmer i'll tell you something 86% of the farmers are small and marginal which means that when they grow crops it is not possible for them to sell the crop immediately and get cash but when you are a farmer you are waiting for selling your crop in the meantime you have to take care of your family their health their education and basic running of the family so for that you need cash so the government of india has started a scheme called as pm kisan under which the government of india provides 6000 rupees a year to the farmers this is to provide income support to the farmer using which the farmer can buy basic agricultural inputs as well as take care of the health education and other requirements of the family another scheme by government of india is called as agriculture infrastructure fund aif which was started during covid as a part of atmanirbhar bharat package see what that fund is suppose guys you are a farmer you have produced crops the moment you produce the crop and harvest it you need a warehouse to store your crop you need packaging material to package it properly and prevent the crop from being destroyed by moisture uh, and other uh, uh, things like temperature difference and all so when you want to protect your crop once the crop is ready you need a storage facility packing facilities transportation facilities you also need to weigh your crops you also need to check their quality how will you come to know about this you will come to know about all of these things if somebody provides you these basic infrastructure facilities so government of india says if there is anybody who wants to provide infrastructure in the field of agriculture they can take loan at a reduced rate of interest so 3% interest subsidy will be provided and using the cash the loan which you have taken you can create infrastructure what are the infrastructures that are being created under the fund warehouses primary processing center custom hiring center sorting and grading unit cold storage assaying centers means those units where quality and quantity is checked etc these are being created under this fund there is pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana guys imagine that you are a farmer you have just sown your crop when the crop is about to be ready there is unnecessary rainfall there is fire in the agricultural field or there is pest attack there is landslide there is hail storm because of these things if your crop is destroyed so see if you lose out your crop because of post harvest losses because of cyclone unnecessary rain untimely rain local calamities hail storm landslide etc then government of india will give you some compensation 
बट फॉर दैट यू हैव टू एनरोल योर सेल्फ अंडर प्रधानमंत्री फसल बीमा योजना सो यू नो हाउ डू यू बाई इंश्योरेंस सो इफ यू बाई एनी इंश्योरेंस यू हैव टू पे अ प्रीमियम अमाउंट फॉर बाइक द इंश्योरेंस एंड वी पे द प्रीमियम मोस्टली एवरी ईयर Similarly, when the farmers buy this insurance scheme, Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bima Yojana, the farmers have to pay a very small sum as premium. So, for example, if they have to give hundred rupees premium, farmers don't have to pay entire hundred rupees. If hundred rupees is the premium amount, farmers have to give just one point five percent. If it's a rabi crop for kharif crop, two percent premium, and for horticulture, five percent. So, if total amount that we have to give to the insurance company is hundred rupees. Farmers have to just give one point five rupees, two rupees, and five rupees respectively for rabi, kharif, and horticulture crop. And in case of any crop losses, the insurance company would provide them uh, compensation. This is Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bima Yojana. And and to handle all the grievances that the farmers are facing when they claim their insurance, national crop insurance portal has been created, using which farmers can get the compensation. now mission for integrated development of horticulture you know east and north east of india they are very famous for horticulture crops what is horticulture fruits vegetable root tuber crop mushroom spices flowers aromatic plant medicinal plants cashew all these things together are bamboo all these things together are called as horticulture government of india has started five sub schemes national horticulture mission horticulture mission for north east and himalayan state national horticulture board coconut development etc these five missions are a part of horticulture development under that the government of india provides 60% central government provides 60% of the total money required for promotion of horticulture state governments provide rest 40% but if it's north east of india and hilly area central government provides 90% and state government provides 10% for rest of india center provides 60 state provides 40% and what do they do they promote quality seeds incentives for plantation incentive for cluster development basic storage facilities all these facilities are given under the scheme whatever is the cost center gives 60% state gives 40% in general national agricultural market so i will tell you what happens under this scheme so guys suppose there is a farmer in punjab and there is a buyer in karnataka and farmer in punjab wants to sell wheat to the buyer in karnataka and karnataka buyer wants to buy the punjab wheat now <clears throat> there is this apmc mandi so the government of india comes to this apmc mandi central government and gives 75 lakh rupees to this mandi so that a computer system can be established here uh, transportation facilities can be arranged packaging facility can be arranged quality check can be done for all these facilities 75 lakh rupees per apmc market is given by central government when the farmer comes here to sell the product the farmer has to put the product on a website called as enam national agricultural market so there is online platform which is created in this mandi the farmer has to upload the pictures and the quality of the product here that this is the name of the rice this is the quality farmer then displays the product which is seen across india suppose there is a buyer in karnataka and buyer says i am ready to give 40 rupees a kg now the farmer has to decide whether 40 rupees a kg is good enough to sell the uh, wheat or not in karnataka because for same wheat if somebody in gujarat is ready to pay 60 rupees a kg and somebody in karnataka is paying 50 rupees a kg now this farmer will decide in punjab whether he wants to sell the crop to gujarat or karnataka this empowers the farmer also and to create the necessary infrastructure online portal etc and packaging and distribution facility central government provides 75 lakh rupees per apmc mandi more than 1.7 crore farmers and 2.3 lakh traders have already enrolled for this scheme called as national agricultural market or enam now guys there is a there is this uh, new practice of agriculture or farming called as climate smart agriculture or farming what is climate smart farming you see according to the latest data roughly 570 million farmers across the world they are under the threat of climate change 
See, when climate changes, temperatures change. Every plant or crop requires a particular temperature and moisture for growth. But if there is a change in temperature and moisture conditions, plant face issues in their growth. So roughly there are 570 million farmers across the world who are facing threat because of changing climatic conditions. So across the world there is a system which is called as climate smart agriculture which means we develop such agricultural practices which help the plant growth despite the change in climatic conditions. So what are the three elements of climate smart agriculture? First element is that we have to increase the productivity and farmers income. How do you make sure that we increase the productivity and farmers income? So we can use technology. For example, if the farmer is cultivating a particular crop, we can use drones and artificial intelligence software, etc. to find out that how is the growth of the plant happening? What is the expected uh, output this year? We can use technology to find this through drone survey, etc adapting to climate change so guys since the climate is changing temperature pressure rainfall is changing we should also change the pattern of cultivation for example we should promote crop rotation so suppose we have planted a crop this month which consumes a lot of nitrogen from the soil next month we should uh, you know cultivate a, a crop which consumes something else so that the soil has every nutrient present in a balanced manner so crop rotation should be there, intercropping should be there, between the two crops also we should plant a particular crop. So intercropping should be there, crop rotation and multiple cropping, different type of plants should be grown together, agroforestry should be promoted. So this is adapting to climate change, reducing greenhouse emission. So greenhouse gases for example carbon, carbon dioxide, so you know we should use more of solar energy and solar technology for irrigation purposes we should use less electricity we should use more solar based energy in the field of agriculture so that greenhouse emission gas of uh, you know gases like carbon dioxide methane etc it is also reduced so what is smart farming so guys smart farming means to promote crop diversification don't indulge in monocropping, indulge in crop diversification because if we grow only one crop on a soil, entire nutrient of the soil will be extracted by that particular plant and soil will become deficient in one nutrient or two nutrients. That's not good. So we should promote diversification and we should reduce dependence on monsoon. That is called as smart farming. Now, there is this, uh, you must have heard that there is this news related to millets. What is this, uh, you know, international millet year and, and why is India promoting millets so much? So let me, let me give you some basic information related to millets. In fact, millets uh, were the first crops to be domesticated in India and we also get a proof of millet domestication in Indus Valley civilization. In fact, if you look at the growth of millets in India, Asia's 80% millets are grown in India and India contributes 20% to the world millet production. If you look at the productivity of millets in India, so the productivity of Indian millets is higher than productivity of the world which means on a small piece of land India grows more millets compared to rest of the countries of the world. So India is very good in millets cultivation. Millet is rich in nutrition also. So the government of India has taken some steps to promote millets. See, so for example, you know millets are a part of national food security mission. We have a program in India called as national food security mission under which we have put millets as a source of nutrition. In fact, in 2018, the government of India declared National Year of Millets. 2018 was declared as National Year of Millets and Millets was declared as Nutri-Cereals in 2018, which means Millets is given the status of that cereal in India, which provides a lot of nutrition. Now, in fact, there are more than 500 startup companies in India, which are related to Millets. And there are 250 startups which are related to millets, which are being given support by government of India through Indian Institute of Millet Research under a program Rashtriya Krishi Vikas Yojana Raftar. Under this, we are supporting 250 millet related startups in India who require finance, who require technical knowledge to convert millets into processed millets. So that is under the scheme called as Raftar. And in fact, government of India had requested United Nation to declare the year 2023 as the International Year of Millets, which the UN has done. So 2023 is the International Year of Millets. So now 
let us look at the allied sector whereby we will be looking at their performance and trend over a period of time guys remember that i told you that indian farmers are suffering from a problem called as land fragmentation which means the average size of land that our farmers have is very small because of that their production is also very low their productivity is also very low so in a country where 86% of the farmers are small and marginal where they have small farm size they must be looking for alternative sources of income for their survival so if we look at agriculture sector and allied activities we have the following categories for example agriculture means crops and allied activities means livestock fishing and forestry now over a period of time what has happened is if suppose 100 rupees has been generated in the field of agriculture so suppose in the field of agriculture the income generated is 100 rupees initially the contribution of cropping was 65% and the contribution of livestock forestry fishing etc was 35% but over a period of time in our agricultural income the contribution of crops are coming down see now they are 55% from 65 to 55 and what is the contribution of allied activities for example livestock forestry fishing all these things are contributing roughly around 45% currently initially they were contributing 35% so over a period of time the contribution of crops in agricultural income has been coming down and the contribution of allied sector has been going up now if we look at the composition we will find that the growth rate of livestock sector is roughly around 7.9 percent in last five years on an average the growth rate is very decent it's touching almost eight percent similarly if we look at the growth rate of fishing in last five to six years average is roughly around seven percent this is the rate at which the fishing has been growing in india now <clears throat> if we look at Component wise, the contribution of crops in agricultural income is 55%, livestock 30%, fishing 7% and forestry 8%. So crops are contributing 55% and allied activities are contributing these together are contributing roughly around 45%. Now guys, which means that allied sector provides a lot of income support to the farmers. That means the government of India must take care of this sector. So the government of India over a period of time has created so many schemes for the development of allied activities. All the schemes related to allied activities can be divided into three categories. One, the scheme related to infrastructure development of allied sector. Second, the schemes related to disease control of the animals. And third, the scheme related to increase production and productivity and bring professionalism in the field of animal husbandry which means we are going to study six schemes related to animal husbandry which has been divided into three categories a scheme related to infrastructure disease control as well as production and business now <clears throat> there is a fund created by government of india called as animal husbandry infrastructure development fund it was created during covid why did the government create it so see the government wanted to increase dairy processing meat processing and animal feed plant which means that government of India wants to develop at a large scale the milk industry, meat industry and how will you get more milk and meat? You have to provide good food to the animal, so animal feed. These three things are being developed in India. So government of India says if anybody wants to make an investment in these three things, government has allocated a fund of 15,000 crore rupees. From there you can take a loan. Whenever you take a loan, you will get a subsidy in interest rate to the extent of 3%. So suppose you take a bank loan to develop any kind of infrastructure related to dairy processing, meat processing or animal feed. Suppose you take a loan from bank, the rate of interest will be 7%. But if you take loan under this scheme, then 3% subsidy in the interest rate will be given. You don't have to pay 7% interest. You will have to pay 7 minus 3, 4% rate of interest. So this is that scheme. The second scheme is called as National Livestock Mission. This scheme was actually started in 2014, but this scheme has been revamped and it will run from you know, 2021, 22 to 25, 26. So this scheme is going to continue till 2025, 20, 26. What is happening under this scheme? So see, the government of India is saying that we want to increase the production of meat, fish, eggs, etc., all the animal product. And those people who are engaged 
in the production of meat, fish, eggs, etc. The government wants to give them a professional touch. The government wants to increase this business. And how to increase this business? By improving the breed of animal, good species of animals, and also by feed development, which means by giving food to the animals. To do these two things, so that our production should increase, our business should increase, the government of India has started a scheme called National Livestock Mission. Now there is a, one more scheme related to health. So Livestock Health and Disease Control Scheme. See, the government of India says that to improve the health of cattle, to improve the health of animals in India, the first priority will be given to development of vaccine. So we will control the disease in animal through vaccine. That's the first point. For example, anthrax, swine flu, etc. Vaccines are being developed. Second, whenever we import cattle from outside India, if those cattle have a particular disease, that disease will spread in India also. So the government of India tries to control such imported diseases. Similarly, we are trying to create more veterinary hospitals. Veterinary hospitals are hospitals meant for animals. With using these three methods, we are trying to promote livestock health in India. Now, similarly, guys, there are two particular cattle diseases in India which have created a lot of, lot of problem in allied sector, foot and mouth disease and brucellosis disease. So we are creating, we have actually created vaccines for disease to help cattle, buffalo, sheep, goat and pigs. This is the scheme which is meant for control of foot and mouth and brucellosis disease. Now, there is one more scheme related to development of fisheries in India. So it is called as Pradhan Mantri Matse Sampada Yojana. You see, if you look at the growth rate of fisheries in last five or six years, it's 7%. But if you look at the growth rate of fisheries in last three years, two to three years, it is a remarkable 14.3% growth rate. Our economy has been growing at a rate of 6%, 7%, but fishery sector has been growing at a rate of 14%, double the rate of growth of economy. Remarkable. So the government of India allocated a fund of 20,000 crore. Why? Because we want to develop more fisheries. We want to promote fish production in India. And how do we want to do it? By giving insurance facilities, by giving cash, by giving Kisan credit card to fishermen. So under this scheme, we provide insurance, financial help and Kisan credit card to the fishermen so as to improve the fish production in this country. We have one more scheme related to aquaculture and fisheries called as Fisheries and Aquaculture Infrastructure Development Fund. It started in 2018. It will run up to 2022-23. There are four things we are trying to achieve through this scheme. Number one, we are trying to promote infrastructure related to fish rearing in India. Right. So creation of new infrastructure and modernization of old infrastructure related to fish rearing. Second, once we indulge into fish rearing, we understand that meat, fish, eggs, they are perishable commodities. So we need to have proper cold storage refrigeration system to improve their life. So post harvest losses have to be reduced. Third, marketing facility has to be improved. Only production is not going to help because these have shorter lifespan. If you don't market it, it will be spoiled very soon. Next is complete the ongoing infrastructure. And in India, there is a problem. We invest in the infrastructure, then we don't complete it. So that is also to be done. And next point is we are trying to generate more employment through these kind of infrastructure generation. And in fact, 9.4 lakh employment has already been generated in the field of aquaculture and fisheries through this scheme. Now guys, we enter into a new topic which is given in this year's economic survey. It is related to cooperatives in India. So it is called as Sahkar Se Samridhi from cooperation to prosperity. What is the meaning of this? So see, the word Sahkar which is given in the economic survey, it, it is a combination of two words Seh and Karya. Seh means cooperate, Karya means task. When we do a task through cooperation, collectively, through the efforts of a group, it is called as cooperation. So in India, the history of cooperation goes centuries back. Cooperation and cooperative movement is not new for India. Economic survey gives a nice explanation about what are cooperatives and how this movement has been generated in India. Let me tell you that. Economic survey says, that if you look at Indian villages, so there is a history of cooperation in different form. For example, when there used to be a pond, village pond, village tank or village forest that used to be constructed, entire villager 
entire village community used to join and they used to create village forest, common village forest, similarly common pond, common water resources and common village tank. Similarly, when the village, the farmers in the village used to undertake farming, they used to collect their entire crop after the harvesting season, entire village used to collect the crop at one place. Why? Because if there is somebody who is facing crop failure and they have not been able to generate a lot of crops, from the collected crops, some help can be provided to those person who are needy. So food grain pooling is also historically done in India. Similarly, guys, there is a system of chit funds in India. For example, 12 people will come together and they will contribute some money in a box. And suppose some everybody is contributing, you know, 100 rupees, 12 people are there, 1200 rupees. So 1200 rupees will be collected every month and one person from the group takes the entire 1200 rupees and I can use this 1200 rupees to improve my house, to buy a tractor, etc. Similarly, next month, somebody else will take 1200 rupees. This is called as pooling of funds. This pooling of fund became you know, more formal and its scope and scale increased and it led to the development of something called as cooperative banks. What are cooperative banks? See, so for example, let's go to a village area. In the village, suppose person number one, two, three, four. These four people have collected cash and they are going to deposit this cash in this office called as cooperative bank. And these four people have elected their representative in this cooperative bank. Then they get the license from Reserve Bank of India who regulates them that cooperative bank is a genuine authority and Reserve Bank of India gives them the license. Now, suppose this person, person number one, requires cash after some time to buy a tractor or somebody fell sick in the house and he needs money for the treatment. So what he can do is he can take out money from here in the form of loan, which of course he has to return later on with a rate of interest. So both deposit and loan giving facility is there in this cooperative bank. So this system of cooperative bank that we see today is not new in India as the economic services. It goes historically centuries of years ago. Now let us look at the structure of cooperative banks in India. And let us also look at who regulates them and what are the new things mentioned in economic survey. So if we look at the cooperative banking system in India, we can broadly divide them. We are not doing microscopic division. We are just doing the division as per economic survey. So cooperative banks in India can be divided into two categories, urban cooperative bank, rural cooperative bank. This rural cooperative bank can be further divided into three categories, state cooperative bank, central cooperative bank, and this is primary agricultural credit society. So in India, if you look at the figures, there are roughly 8.5 lakh cooperatives in India and 29 crore members have enrolled in those cooperatives. And what is the most important role of these cooperatives? These cooperatives not only provide finance. For example, if I'm a farmer, I want to buy tractor. I can take loan from this. So roughly 19% of agricultural finance. So if in the field of agriculture, farmers are taking 100 rupees loan, 19 rupees loan comes through cooperatives. So cooperatives provide safety net and livelihood to the farming community and rural areas. If you look at the cooperatives, we can clearly see that this primary agricultural credit society, which are mostly in working in the field of agriculture, they cover almost 98% villages. So in 98% villages of India, you will find PACs, CS. Primary Agricultural Credit Society. The government of India has recently taken a lot of reforms in the field of cooperative. For example, in the year 2021, the foundation was laid for Ministry of Cooperation. Similarly, the government is creating a new policy called as New National Cooperation Policy. So we are creating a new cooperative policy which is being formulated by government of India and government of India has invited views and opinions from different sections of the society. Similarly, guys, the government of India has also created Multi-State Society Cooperative Society Act. What is Multi-State Cooperative Society Act? See, there are many cooperatives where the farmers are collaborating, but those cooperatives are not only present in one state, but they will be present in multiple districts and multiple states. For example, cooperative related to milk, 
they don't operate from one state they operate from many state cooperative related to sugar so again they operate from multiple states so they are called as multi state cooperative society the government of india has created an act to regulate them in 1984 that they had to follow certain rules and regulations but in 2002 the government of india changed the rules of multi state cooperative society act and the government of india tried to make them more professional to bring better rules and regulations democratic system in the cooperatives but in 2022 the government of india further made a change in the multi state cooperative society act and government is trying to bring it according to part 9b of the indian constitution which talks about cooperatives the government is trying to make the election uh, of the members of the cooperative very transparent they are functioning to be more transparent and professional these things are being introduced through 2022 amendment similarly guys the primary agricultural credit society which mostly caters to the farming and the village area the government is trying to computerize their records computerization brings more transparency in the system similarly the government is creating bylaws for cooperatives bylaws contains all the sets of rules and regulations which helps in the operations and functions of these organizations so these steps have been mentioned in economic survey now <clears throat> if we look at which states of india are leading states in terms of multi state cooperative societies which states have the maximum multi state cooperative society so maharashtra tops the list see number of such societies 661 and then delhi then up and you see kerala these are the top 10 states of india right now <clears throat> we are going to enter something very crucial which is called as food processing industry now guys why is food processing industry important food processing industry is important because india is one of the leading producers of food in the world but india also wastes a lot of food if we develop more industries which will convert tomatoes into tomato ketchup which will convert more milk into butter etc our food wastage will come down it will also give more employment to our village community because there is a problem of disguised unemployment indian food is also famous because of its great quality because we have diversified weather conditions so our quality is also good so we can process the food and export food as well it will also increase india's gdp so employment will increase gdp will increase exports will increase food wastage will come down this is important if you look at the food processing industry some facts are there so what is the average rate of growth of food processing industry in last 5 years roughly 8.3% which is very decent what is the contribution of food processing industry in employment in india approximately 11.6% and if you look at their contribution in the field of organized manufacturing registered manufacturing their contribution is 12.2% what is the contribution of food processing industry in exports 10.9% which is roughly around 11% but there are some problems related to food processing industry in india what is the biggest problem related to fpi in india absence of cold storage and warehouse is a big problem India does not have enough of cold storage whatever cold storage we have it is present in some selected states of india only which means there is a regional disparity in the cold storage in india so first we need to improve cold storage then remove the regional disparity and there is one more problem is the economic services economic services that more than 40% cargo cargo means movement of goods more than 40% cargo of india is transported using 2% roads so very few roads in india are used for transportation of almost half of our cargo which means there is a lot of burden on some roads of india so if you transport all your trucks using some roads it will lead to congestion and traffic jam and delays and if processed food is kept on the road for very long the processed food becomes toxic we need to focus on these challenges to remove these challenges the government of india has started some schemes related to food processing so see guys the scheme that is mentioned in the economic survey is pradhan mantri kisan sampada yojana pradhan mantri or prime minister's formalization of micro food processing enterprises it is also called as fme and this is called as sampada yojana 
So if you read this kind of literature, it's very complicated. I'm going to simplify this using some diagrams for you. So what is PM Sampada, Sampada Yojana? So see, the government of India realized that there are many schemes related to food processing industry since last 10-15 years. There are many new schemes also. It is very confusing for somebody who wants to enter into food processing, whether to go with old scheme or new scheme. So the government of India merged old and new schemes under one umbrella scheme called as Sampada. This is good governance because all the old scheme and new scheme have been merged together in Sampada. And then government of India allocated roughly around 6,000 crore rupees under Sampada to construct basic infrastructure related to food processing so that our industries do not suffer a problem. So basic infrastructure related to food processing would mean electricity, water, cold storage, warehouse, all this quality check, safety check, all these things. So Sampada is an umbrella scheme. Similarly, guys, if you look at the Indian food processing industry, there are lakhs of food processing units which are very small and they are also unorganized in nature. If you are un unorganized, which means you are not registered. So suppose I convert mangoes into pickle. I am unorganized and I am not registered. If I go to a bank to take credit because I need a loan to buy a better machine, I can't do that because bank will not give me loan. So government of India created a scheme called as FME, formalization of micro food processing enterprises, whereby the government said that all these food processing units in India, which are small and unorganized, government is going to give them up to 10 lakh rupees cash subsidy so that they can buy better machines, they can improve themselves and they can create better products to modernize them. Similarly, government of India said if 10, 20, 30 people will come together to create a self-help group and they want to start a food processing industry, for example, to convert mangoes into pickled tomatoes into tomato ketchup, the government of India is ready to give them 40,000 rupees seed capital. What is seed capital? Seed capital is the money with which you start a business. So if any self-help group will go to government of India, government of India will give them 40,000 rupees seed capital if they are in the field of food processing industry. So this is for small food processing industry. But guys, along with the small food processing industry, government of India says that we also need to have big food processing industries in India, which can be so big that they can become one of the dominant global exporters. I'll give an example. So suppose guys, this is a food processing industry which manufactures ice cream in India. The government of India goes to them and asks them that, okay, Mr. Food Processing Industry, can you please tell us that in the year 2009, what was the total value of sale of your ice cream? So suppose they are saying 100 crore rupees. Then the government of India asked them that what was the sale of your ice cream in the year 2020? Suppose they said 140 crore, which means has there been an increase in their sale? Yes. What is the increase in sale between these two years? 40 crore rupees is the increase in sale. Then the government of India asked them that what was the total investment in your machines or factory in the year 29? They said 2 crore. Then the government of India asked them in 2020 that what was the investment in your plant and machinery in the year 2020? They said 3 crore. Then the government of India asked them that what is your total increase in investment? They said 1 crore between 2019 and 2020. So what are the two things that the government found out? The government found out that using 2019 as the reference year in the year 2020, sale has also increased, investment has also increased in this ice cream factory, which means this ice cream factory has potential. So now the government of India says that whatever is your increase in sale, 40 crore is the increase in sale. So government of India calculates, for example, 10% certain percentage like 10% of 40 crore. 40 crore is the increase in sale. So 10% of 40 crore is 4 crore. This 4 crore, the government of India gives as subsidy to this company and says that you, Mr. Company, use this 4 crore rupees to buy better quality inputs, better quality raw material, packaging facility, branding, marketing, and export your ice cream to rest of the world and become one of the leading exporters of ice cream. When you become a leading exporter of a product across the world, then you are called as global champion. So through this scheme, we are trying to create global champion of food processing industry in India. This scheme that the government has used is called as production linked incentive scheme.
Now there is one more scheme guys. The next scheme is called as Krishi Udan scheme. Krishi Udan 2.0. What is happening under this scheme? See, if you look at different parts of India, they are good in different products. For example, if you look at East and Northeast of India, they are very good in horticulture, fruits, vegetable, medicinal plants, etc. If you look at the region of, for example, the Haryana area, Western UP, etc., you see Gujarat area, you see a lot of milk production in this area. So guys, suppose that there is a flight aircraft and suppose that somebody wants to put fruits, vegetable, milk, meat, fish, eggs in this aircraft in northeast of India. And this aircraft is going to, let's say, Maharashtra. The moment this aircraft reaches Maharashtra, then people take out the milk, meat, fish, eggs, fruits, vegetable, and they sell it in Maharashtra. Now, the price of fruits, vegetable in Northeast and Maharashtra will be different. Why? Because when you take something through aircrafts, you, have, you will add the cost of aircraft in the price of fruits and vegetable. Government of India says that since India wants that product of one part of India should be freely available to other part of India at affordable price, whenever somebody uses flight services to take fruits, vegetable, etc., etc., at commercial level from one part of India to another, government of India will give them discounts related to landing charge, parking charge, navigation charge. So if this aircraft reaches Maharashtra, Mumbai airport, government of India is not going to collect landing, parking, navigation fee, completely zero. Which means if these kind of charges are zero, then the price of fruits, vegetable, etc. in Maharashtra will also be very low because cost of transportation reduces. We are doing this under Krishi Udan. Now guys, we come to the most important section which is mentioned in the economic survey in this topic called agriculture. It is food security and under food security, the economic survey says social and legal commitment to Indians. So what is mentioned in this topic? So guys, before we discuss what is food security, we, we must understand what is the definition of food security. So officially, the definition of food security was given by World Food Summit in 1996, which talks about the definition of food security in general. It says that food security is not only a question of ability to produce food, but also of the ability to access food. So guys, suppose that a country is producing a lot of food, but people in that country are not able to access the food. What is the point of having such a food? So food security has two aspects. One, production. And second is ability to access. So in the World Food Summit 1996, a definition of food security was given, which has four components. The first component of food security says there should be physical availability of food, which means physically food should be there. And food will be there only when you produce it. Second, economic and physical access to food. So people should be able to afford that food. Next is food utilization. If my body is not able to use the food biologically, there is no point in having it. So there must be capacity inside me to use the food. Next is stability of other three dimensions. The fourth point says these three things should be stable in the economy or the country. Then it is called as food security. What is the system of food security in India, guys? See, so what the government of India does is, so suppose this is government of India. Our farmers produce a lot of crops. The government of India goes to them and the government of India takes, you know, crops from them and the government of India pays them minimum support price. So when the farmers produce the crop, government buys the crop, right? Certain amount of crop and government pays them minimum support price. So farmers get fair price and government gets food grains. Out of that food grain, the government of India keeps certain amount in the buffer stock for bad times. If there is any kind of epidemic, war, any kind of situation, shortage of food grains, then this buffer is used by the government of India. So certain percentage is kept at buffer. Another percentage of food grain that the government got from the farmer is distributed to Indians who are either very, very poor or they are poor. They cannot afford food grain, so government provides them help. So government of India has started something called as National Food Security Act 
under national food security act the government of india is distributing food grains both free of cost and at affordable prices to roughly 80 crore indians india comprises of two parts rural india and urban india so roughly 75% of rural India and 50% of urban India. 75% rural, 50% urban. If you combine it, 80 crore people. So government of India is providing food grain to roughly 80 crore people either free of cost at or at affordable price. So government of India says there are two types of poor. One who are so poor that they cannot pay even 1 rupee or 2 rupee for the food grain. So government of India gives them 35 kg of food every month per household. So if I am a poor family, I cannot pay even one rupee or two rupee. The government of India provides me 35 kg food grains per month per household. But if I can pay one, two or three rupees a kg, I am poor, but I can pay certain amount. Then government of India gives me ration card and government of India provides me five kg of food grain per person per month and the price that government would charge is highly subsidized 3 rupees for rice 2 rupees for wheat and 1 rupees for coarse cereals so see so 5 kg per person rice wheat and cereals 3 2 and 1 rupees per kg this is given by government of india so if you are extremely poor the government of india will give you 35 kg food grain it is called as antyode anna yojana and those people who buy the food grain at subsidized rate are called priority sector household. They get the food grains at 3, 2 and 1 rupees. Who identifies who is Antyoda Anna Yojana category and who is priority sector household? State governments. So there are two types of poor guys. One who are the poorest of the poor. They cannot afford even 1 rupee. They are called as Antyoda Anna Yojana category people. And then there are poor who can afford one or two rupees. They are called as priority sector household. It is the job of a state government to identify them and give them ration cards. Then during COVID, the government of India added one more dimension in this policy and government said all those people of Antyoday Anna Yojana who are getting 35 kg food grain free of cost, the government said you will get 5 kg more. So under Due to COVID situation, under a scheme called Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Anna Yojana, so this 35 kg became 40 kg. And here, the priority households are getting 5 kg per person per month. For this, they are paying 3 rupees, 2 rupees and 1 rupees per kg. The government of India has also given them 5 kg free, which means for 5 kg, they have to pay 3 rupees, 2 rupees or 1 rupee a kg. But for the other 5 kg, they don't have to pay anything. So both the categories are getting 5 kg in addition to what they were earlier getting. And this extra 5 kg that they are getting is free for both of them. This is called as Pradhan Mantri Garib Kalyan Anna Yojana. And it was started during COVID, but in the current budget and economic survey, the government has continued this policy. Now there is one more scheme which has been started by government of India called as One Nation, One Ration Card Scheme. What does the scheme say? The scheme says, guys, that suppose I am a poor person and I belong to Madhya Pradesh, UP or Bihar. I have got a ration card. Using the ration card, I am getting 5 kg food grains for 3 rupees, 2 rupees or 1 rupees or I am Antyoday Anna Yujana, I am getting 35 kg food, food grains per month. Now, suppose I belong to Bihar and I come to Delhi for work. I am working in the field of construction. I am a worker. When I come to Delhi, I don't have a ration card of Delhi. So can I get food grains from the public distribution system, which is there in Delhi? Earlier, it was not possible. Now the government has created this scheme called One Nation, One Ration Card. So if I get a ration card in Bihar or UP or Madhya Pradesh, if I'm a worker and I come to Delhi for work, I can use the same ration card across any state or union territory of India to get my food grains. It's a great scheme for migrant workers, especially in a country like India. UPSC has a very good habit of asking trend related questions. So UPSC might ask you that what is the trend of food subsidy in India? So see guys, total food subsidy released by government of India. See the trend is going up. I taught you in this lecture that when you have to find the trend, pick up a point in the starting year and pick up a point in the year till which you want to find the trend and then connect those points. See, so the trend is food, secure, food subsidy bill was increasing in India from 2014 to 2020. 
Why did it increase so much in 2020? Because it was COVID time and the government distributed a lot of food grains. But then <clears throat> the total food subsidy has come down because after COVID, the government of India has reduced the allocation of, of the budget towards food subsidy. So this completes our lecture on agriculture, chapter number 8, Economic Survey 22-23. So we'll be back with the next lecture very soon. Thank you so much.